Hello, hello, and welcome. I'm Meron Kilini. We are DM25, Radical Political Movement for Europe. And this is a conversation with Kostadina Zürcher, a political scientist based in Austria, about the general election that just happened yesterday, where the far-right party, the Freedom Party of Herbert Kickel, who vows to bring about a fortress Austria, has won the national election. So what does this mean? What does this mean for Austria? What does this mean for Europe? How did they do it? Kostadina, welcome. Please put us in the picture. Thank you for having me. So, uh, yes, the one, um, I think the last time I checked, they are still at 28,8, 29% of the votes. Um, so around three percentage points ahead of the Conservatives. Yes, they are number one, first time in history. Um, but it's not an earthquake. So when you listen to the local analysis of, of political scientists, of journalists, this is nothing that is a, a surprise. It was pretty obvious that this time they will make it. Um, even the percentage is not um, something like, oh my God, how much they, they have won, but it's basically what was expected. And also that the Conservatives are, are number two is what was expected, that the Greens lost. So it's not an earthquake. It's an earthquake... Um, meaning that more like a shock that it's happening in this historical uh, circumstances because it's Austria, we have a path. Just to understand what is the path to power? Because the headlines that I've read about this is that it's a, uh, uh, yes, it, it, they say it's an earthquake. Okay, I mean, you can say that there's some sensationalist headlines around it. Um, but don't worry, because the other political parties have refused to work with the Freedom Party and Austria has coalition governments and therefore they have no path to power. So what is the chance that this party could play a role in a coalition government? And if not, what does that imply and how would they, how would they uh, play a role in Austrian politics going forward? Number one, it is not exactly true that all parties have said they are not going to work with them. So the Conservatives have said they will not be making a government with Herbert Kickel, who was prior to, in, a pre, in a previous government Minister of Interior, that doesn't mean they are not going to collaborate with the Freedom Party, as they already do in many, we call it Bundesländer, in many federal states. So this is not exactly true. They say not Herbert Kickel, but why should the Freedom Party, being now number one because of Herbert Kickel, who was famously under uh, the, the number two, uh, say, no, we are not going with our number one because he actually won the election. So you have to think about this kind of um, uh, thing. Don't worry. Yes, you, th there is a kind of, um, we call it security boundary in Austrian politics that uh, because you're number one as a political party, the election doesn't make you... Um, the, the government and doesn't give you the councillor because this is upon the president to decide. And the, um, the, the president in Austria has the constitutional right to decide to whom he's giving um, the mandate to form a government. Discussions, informal discussions are surely already running between the political parties, that's, that's obvious. Uh, but he is going to give the mandate to the um, um, the coalition or the government or the, 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 the people, uh, the, the party going forward, this, coming with um, uh, the most stable proposal for Austria and the most democratic proposal based on the, um, on the values of the constitution, because this is what he was elected for. He was elected for in order to make Austria stable and that Austria stays democratic. That's why he is president, because the president is elected directly. So that would be interesting. There might be, um, the conservatives will not say, uh, will not uh, give up the councillery that easily. There's no way um, they are going to give up the power. And also what is, what was un, an unlikely marriage some years before is that there might be a coalition formed by three political parties, if not four. I kind of find it unlikely that it will be four, the Social Democrats, Conservatives, the Greens, and the, um, the Neos, the Liberals. 
I see it more likely that it will be free. But again, it will be a very difficult marriage, as the previous government already was, because it was the Conservatives with the Greens. So now being three parties makes it more um, difficult. It will be interesting to watch. Um, and on what premise the new government is formed, because Kiko is very straightforward, very clear. No migration, fortress Austria. Uh, a coalition government needs a narrative. And what will be this narrative? That will be the difficult question. Um, and for sure, we won't have a government um, until Christmas. Mm. I don't see it happening. Um, so we will see. But can I ask you something there, because, you know, I mean, if those kinds of... Um, well, <laughs> I look, I don't want a hard right government in another European country, or I don't want a hard right government to, to, in any European country, uh, any more than you do. But if those kinds of maneuverings take place in order to keep this government out of power, won't those voters, which, as I understand it, the Freedom Party were most popular among voters uh, aged between 50, sorry, 30 and 59, mostly based in, in the rural areas rather than the cities. Won't they feel disenfranchised? Um, uh, won't they have a right to say, hey, uh, this was my democratic vote. Um, I, I went out and now you're and voted and now you're disregarding it. Um, and won't that actually in the long run help this party to, to go out and say they don't want us and, and they're trying anything to stop us? So there, it happened in, in history before that not the number one uh, was um, given the mandate. So um, when the Freedom Party entered this for the first time after many years, a coalition with the Conservatives in 1999, 2000, that was with Haider, um, the first party were the Social Democrats. And they were given the mandate, but the Conservatives had met discussion with the Freedom Party. And then we had the first, actually, we call it the Black-Blue Coalition. And it was the first time the far right is enter, would enter government. So it will be the third time in the last um, years that it's entering government. So it's not the first for them. It will be the first time they might have um, the right to have a councillor, but this right is not, it's not written in the books. There is a tradition, but it's not written in the books, neither in the Constitution, that the first one is going to give the country. So that is a hard uh, discussion. They might get stronger, but what, what has to be addressed is why they got so strong during the last years. And this is not just a protest vote. So what we have to be conscious about, whether uh, for, on what side we are staying on the spectrum of politics, we have to be very conscious about why they got elected. And this is not protest anymore, because when you look at the ages who voted for them, it's not just the elderly. It's the generation between 25 and 59. So it's working population. It's not people that are not active. Um, so there is a very harsh critique on the previous government, obviously, uh, not just the Greens, also the Conservatives, because the Conservatives lost most of their vote to the Freedom Party. And the Freedom Party managed something that other parties were not that able to, to mobilize, the non-voters, the people that usually are not voting. Mm. So this is not protest. This is a sign that something is not right. Mm. And the solutions and the way the solutions are implemented are not having the consent of a large part of the population. Mm. And when we go very harshly, it goes to all parties that they're not speaking the language people are understanding and people want something they understand, they can grasp and they can go forward to for the future. Because when you look at how COVID was handled, um, which in Austria was actually quite amazingly handled because everyone got access to vaccines and to tests that were for free. So um, when you can do a PCR five times a week for free, this is a, the, that is luxury. Um, then, yes, they were harsh on the people not uh, uh, doing the vaccines, yes, but then you have seen that Austria went into economic crisis like the whole of Europe because of uh, the energy crisis and because of COVID, how this was handled, people were not really satisfied, mm -hmm. then how education is handled, how the social system, so it's not that 
it's just protest. It's people want something different, mm -hmm. but they, they need something to work with because you cannot expect the, the normal citizen to come up with all the solutions. That's why you're voting for politicians. Mm -hmm. So you want something to, to work with. And this, I think, most of the parties fails, including the Social Democrats, including the Greens. The Greens are going usually with their climate um, agenda, which is very important right now, really, really important. But um, when you ask the population uh, about climate, if, they, if they're suffer to go to the supermarket, then climate comes second. Well, I'm so glad that you're so touching you have on this. To... Yeah, sorry, sorry to cut you off, but I'm so glad that you're touching on this because often when, I mean, th this is not the first time that a far right party has done really well in Europe. Um, for anyone not paying attention to Europe, uh, it's the last couple of weeks have seen far right gains in local elections in Germany. We've had France, we've had the Netherlands, Sweden, others. Um, and every time it's the same sort of reaction. It's like the, the establishment and many left uh, groups are panic. And it's like shock. And there's never this sort of curious posture that I think they need to adopt, which is how did they do this? What are they addressing? What need are they addressing? And what tactically did they do in order to make these gains? So I'm glad you're touching on these. And I want to I want to pick up on something you said about about communication and about um, about simplicity of messaging. I've read that Kickel, the, the leader of the Freedom Party, um, rather like Trump, in 2016 and now uh, was trashing the media a lot and refused to give interviews, um, refused to join debates. And instead, he was taking a very direct route via social media to the people. Um, can you comment on that at all, that approach from a communications point of view and, and what he did and how it was successful? Yeah, you know, that's not new for the Freedom Party. We should not forget who Kiko was. Kiko was a speechwriter of Haida. That's not new. So he did actually the same, but now it was the person who, who was writing the things and who was strategizing. So it was the actual mind behind it uh, that is very authentic. He is, he is a smart man, which is for the fire right quite, quite um, important, but he, he is rhetorically very, very uh, gifted. Uh, which is in the far right also, you, you can see it. rhetorically they can provide answers, they are speaking very well, um, even if they're kind of not engaging in a topic, they know how to uh, exit a topic. So he's rhetorically very gifted, whether I like it or not, he is. And that is an asset that the others might not have that in place as, as he has, uh, it has, and the Freedom Party has it very strongly. So that is charismatic for many people, that somebody can speak freely uh, without interruption, provide quick answers, um, very um, conscious, very um, uh, with a standing, not being uh, intimidated or whatever. That, that's a very strong point, and that's something that people are wanting from politics, that you have, in that part, the strong man having a standing. Because, look, that was, um, when you look at the elections, you have just women being a leader uh, in the political spectrum. That is from the liberals. You don't have any other female being very prominent right now. Hmm. So that language... Um, I think the formula is not, I would not say it's tr Trump. I just think they were working their old formula, that they already have being direct, because being direct with people, they, already, they always did. They always have their offices in neighborhoods that are difficult or have migration issues or have um, income issues, inequality. They always have it there. So they're very direct to the population from the days I remember, and they know where to go to. For example, they will go to a neighborhood where social democrats are strong. They will not be afraid of it. Well, they will go direct and speak. On that point regarding Trump, I mean, I, I, it's my understanding that Kickle is not a kind of loud, flamboyant, uh, populist type figure, that actually he's quite low profile. There's very little known about his private life. Um, and that he, he's not that sort of bombastic figure. Is that true? 
Yes and no. He is loud when he's speaking. <laughs> he is loud when he's speaking. But um, he, he is not shiny. That's the truth. Um, there is no lifestyle about him. Um, um, the scandals on the rumors about him are really political. There is, there, there, you, you cannot touch him on a personal level. And that's, that's a very, very good move from the Freedom Party, that he's actually just a politician for people. That he's nothing, he's, he is a human being, but he is a politician foremost. And I think that um, that gives a way that he, you cannot mix, you cannot attack him on a personal level, uh, like they did with other leaders in the past. Um, also, he insists of being uh, judged strictly on what he's going to do and his ideas. And so he, he does that. And he, what he does, he doesn't mind to be liked. He's attacking journalists. He will confront journalists, he, even if they have the right to make questions. But he will, uh, he will speak back. He won't try to be super diplomatic about things. So this is something that people might like. Well, indeed, some of the ideas that um, I've been reading that he's been putting forward, like remigration, a concept involving expelling uh, immigrants, uh, these, well, in some quarters would be quite controversial. Uh, but now that you've commented on uh, the tactics that he's used and his communication style, can we look a little bit at the the needs that he's actually responding to and how how these ideas are resonating um, and why, as we've said earlier, uh, other parties are, are somehow not tackling these needs. Look, his ideas uh, are not new. Um, they're going back and they're very simple, but there, there's often a question asked. For example, the Social Democrats now have a very, um, let's say, idealistic leader who wants to come back with um, um, ideas of the left that, um, that are very traditional. And the, the question will be, yes, the social democrats are very utopistic and idealistic about their, the, what, their ideas, but why shouldn't we vote for the Freedom Party that has also quite um, uh, simple idealistic solutions and give them a, st a chance because they haven't been uh, a councillor yet from the Freedom Party. So this is one question that is coming up often. Um, and not only by people that are voting for the Freedom Party, also by people that were traditionally conservative or traditionally social democrat. Because to be honest, simple ideas are in all political um, uh, leagues. They're not uh, unique to the far right. Uh, it's just that uh, political parties that have been in government before know that it's not that easy to do that simple solution. And the Freedom Party, because they have always been the junior party, still can go with a simple solution. That's easy because you haven't been the councillor. You, you, you have had some ministries, but you haven't had the actual standing point of being the leader of a government. That's very different. Hmm. But, um, but how about on the left? That's if, what people... Yeah, sorry, we're having some connection troubles, so I think there's a bit of a, mm -hmm. a, a, bit of a delay. But uh, what about on, on the left? Is there, are there other parties which are on the left which have not necessarily you know are not necessarily part of the political establishment but were competing in this election and and how how did they do what was their message in comparison to um kickles i think the most interesting thing on the left side would be the communist party that slightly did not make it um into parliament this time uh it's four percent that they have to reach in order to enter parliament, the 2,4, but it's the highest percentage they ever made after uh, World War II. Um, they are in government in some um, cities already. So the Communist Party went with the um, uh, living issue with rents and uh, access, uh, uh, access to, to apartments. They went with this issue, what was very interesting. And this hat trade, this hat tracking, so people were interested in the issue because people are bothered. Um, but that was their central one. 
that was the, there were firms for the greens on the other side went for climate and social justice but more climate um where they were also really successful as a government party to be honest uh so there were a lot of initiatives um from the Austrian government regarding climate. And the Social Democrats, to be honest, they just elected a year ago, a year and a half, their new leader. They were in internal fights for many, many years, and there still are. Just before the elections, they got again an internal fight, uh, two weeks before the elections, actually. So even if they had ideas, they did not touch you because people remember they're fighting with each other. Mm. And what Austria wants, and Austria is famous for, and the people of Austria want, is stability. They don't want somebody who is fighting with each other. They want stability and straightforward things. They do not want um, that, um, they say they don't want kindergarten politics. They want adults. Hmm. So if they see that the political parties internally are not stable, they're not trusting them because stability is something Austria is aiming for. I mean, every country is aiming for, but Austria wants it and tries to sustain it for, for many, many decades after the Second World War. That's why this country is flourishing, the welfare state is well in place, mm. the social contracts are well in place. There are many things that are in place that other countries are still not having that much in place and established, and Austria is famous for. Mm. So the Austrians want that. There's nobody saying we don't want that uh, health system. Everybody wants a good health system. Mm. There's nobody saying we don't want the free education. Mm. We don't want um, the access to public transport. And everybody wants it. But the, the Freedom Party came, uh, well, got this result largely on an anti-immigration platform, though. So if the voters are really saying that for them, immigration is the, uh, such a key issue, let me ask you, what are the other parties saying what were they saying about that what were the greens saying what were the communists saying on that issue so migration is always the the number one issue for the freedom party it always was it's nothing new that was the, that's their pet uh, issue um the the conservatives tried a little uh, tried to to make a standing and have a similar position but not remigration by any chance so the conservatives would never talk about remigration they will make um they will talk about how to regulate they will talk about to make it maybe more, more difficult to enter austria um how to get asylum so they will talk about the regulation stuff the social democrats for me, do not have a clear standing because sometimes they say we have to regulate, we have to regulate, but then they're talking about solidarity. Uh, the Greens are moved about solidarity, but the communists I haven't heard anything on migration that is tangible. So um, because then they're actually new, and in the cities they are in government, um, it's a local issue, mm. very different than a national issue. Um, and also, what we should not forget. Um, when we talk about migration, the new commissioner of interior issues and migration from the European Commission will be the 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 not the the um, finance minister of Austria, uh, Markus Brunner, is going to be, get that portfolio. So Austria will have a standing on that issue on a European level, but also will influence on a national level what's going to happen because the portfolio is on Austria. So hmm. the conservatives don't really need to have a positioning because they're having the commissioner. Okay. It's a combination of things. So whoever is going to be in government on this issue, they will have to, to discuss with um, an Austrian person, uh, the former finance minister on migration issues on a European level. So I think we often forget that those things are intermined a little bit. Okay. Is there anything else that comes to mind in terms of what could be learned from this um, going forward? Uh, what, what could left-wing parties take from this result? Not necessarily just in Austria, but, but, um, but across Europe. Because I fear that we haven't, uh, you know, this won't be the last uh, far-right success that we see um, in, in the near future. So what's the takeaway for you? What needs to happen that isn't happening already on the left? Number one, we have to take the far right seriously in what they're saying and what they're doing. So this is something serious. This is not just protest. And we cannot speak about the voters of 
the freedom party or whatever far right party just saying they are nasty they are voting for protests they don't know about politics you can't talk about this uh, because if if you talk about vote, uh, with voters then you will see they are not really nazis they are not really far right or racist they're just um um questioning if the solutions are in place or thought through and they have no other mean in order to um to make their voice heard so they go to the far right and they're not going to the left because the left is often lost in philosophical discussions in terms uh, in fighting each other like the social democrats are fighting other uh, more progressive uh, movements of the left rather than saying this is what unites the left and we're coming forward with a platform that these are the actual tangible and implementable solutions for the next decade because this is what the left is not coming forward they're coming forward with very good ideas especially on climate change and social justice but you have to make a step plan the far right is so simple they don't even need a step plan they say this we're going to do a migration issue we do remigration they don't even need a strategy about it because everyone understands what they're meaning so what you would need is as a left or progressive movement is that you need to have the same simple, um, not approach, you need a step plan so people can follow and can understand, not that they're not understanding, but they can grasp it. If you can explain it to a child, then you're on the right way. If a child doesn't understand what you're doing, then you're doing it wrong. That sounds very harsh, but if you listen to people, then you see, uh, you have to explain to them why is climate change also a social issue. If you explain why climate change is a social issue and it's that the reason why you might not be able to pay things in the supermarket, you don't have purchase power, then people start to think twice. If you just say climate is climate, social justice, social justice and the income is income and you separate issues like the far right usually does, um, then it's easy but doesn't mean that you, have a, that you have a result in the end. You have one little result for one small issue. And I think if you make step plans um, that, are, um, that you can follow and you can say, okay, this will be the first year, for example, this will be in the second year, this will be in the third year, then people are more eager to understand but, and to trust because they think, ah, oh, you have a plan. And this is actually doable yeah. because what we see from the left is the ideas are sometimes very, very good. Uh, you don't have that clear picture of how it will be implemented. And then people saying the left is about utopias. Mm. But the truth is, it's not utopias. You need the steps. I think that's a very valid point to, to break down uh, the vision into the steps that you would take to get there. But I might also add that... Um, and this is something that came up, for example, in the in the last live stream that we that we did uh, on on the uh, on the subject of what was happening in Germany in recent weeks. The left often just takes things um, takes a very intellectual stance and explains it without emotion. If you've got stats, they'll never they'll never they'll always lose out to someone else's story. Um, I think that injection of emotion and simplifying things in terms of stories rather than presenting uh, just a step by step plan that is where the that's where the left fails and that's where other parties and often on the right um and you can say of course it's easier for them because they they they're saying things which are um maybe more simplistic or um just very simple simply hitting certain certain emotional notes but the left needs to do that as well it's a skill. I'm not sure it comes naturally to left-wing parties, but I don't see anyone really taking up the challenge on the left and delivering that combination of a step-by-step -step plan, but with the emotional resonance that people feel, these guys understand my situation. These guys get me. They chime with what I'm feeling. Um, what would you say to that? What I'm often afraid of the left is that the left might think that they are losing their intellectual standing if they're going with a more simple step-by-step uh, -step plan or narrative, um, which is, um, for me, very... It's a pity because you're not losing intellectualism or on, on facts just because your packaging is in a very, very different way. 
and um, it's all about using the right language and the language that has to be spoken is the language outside of your bubble. If you go on the street, that's the language you have to speak um, and not um, in, in a university or in a philosophical bubble. So the language is the language of the street. That, that's very harsh and populist as, as, you, as it sounds, but that's the truth. That's the truth. Um, so um, they, I don't think it's lost. I don't think they cannot. But what, what is now the standing for the last year, the last two years, where we see the far right all, all over Europe rising and also in the United States, is you have to take those people seriously. Mm. They're not stupid. They're not non-intellectuals. They are different. They speak differently. This doesn't mean that... We don't have to take them seriously. Mm. On the contrary, I think, ex especially because the language the far right is using and demagogues and populists are using, that is exactly the reason why we should listen more and think about it more. Because it's not... 10 years ago, people were saying, yes, the uneducated population is voting for the far right mm. because they don't understand. That is not the case anymore. And it, it, I, I, I actually don't agree that this was the case every time. You have highly educated, highly income people voting for the far right. You don't have people that don't have the access to education information. So mm. we have to take it seriously if we want to make a change. And if it's highly educated people, then you have also the education intellectual elite preferring the far right rather than a more progressive uh, standing. And the more progressive standing it's not that we say it will be Mar the Marxist manifest coming into place. We're talking about very basic things like access to education, access to living, access to food. We're not talking about uh, highly, about the left of the 18th and the 19th century. We're talking about very basic things. I completely agree with you. Um, the, the, the idea that the, the people that vote for far right parties are just the rubes, uh, the the rednecks, the the hicks who are living out there outside of uh, you know outside of the urban environments who don't really understand um, these issues and and therefore they've just been suckered into this populist rhetoric and they're voting. That is such an unhelpful idea, and I I constantly hear that response from left quarters. But another response, and and I think we can close with this, um, that I often hear from the left in reaction to these kinds of results is, well, that's just racism and xenophobia for you, you know? And I don't, I, I'm not saying that there is not a kernel of truth in that. There will always be some racists and xenophobes who will vote for the far right on those grounds. But to say that this result, I, I forget the percentage, but that this enormous percentage of people across, across age groups, um, are all racist or to imply that, that it's racism and xenophobia that's driving this result, I think that's, that's just going to uh, offend and upset people even more when some of those people might be even listening to you as a left party and they might be, a, a, they might be attracted to your ideas if they're said to those people in the right way. What do you think about that? I would just say that you, you can't just say they're all racist. That's, 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 that's exactly the way, for example, I would say the far right wants you to respond with the same simplistic way. Uh, so th you are not digging any deeper for the why. And I think that is the earthquake that many people saw it coming and now it's a fact. And it's not a fact because all people are racist. I, I, would, um, I would highly disagree that whoever voted for the Freedom Party is a racist. And I know people that have voted for it. So, and there are very decent people that do have uh, worries about the future, that do see a lot of inequalities, but they do not see answers from any other political, um, uh, from any other political uh, leader or any political party. And that's why they say, okay, there is an answer. I'm going to do that. Mm -hmm. It's not that they're racist or I would, I would rather, I would rather say it's easy to say 
they are racist and they are in fear and they are not thinking. That's very easy, but that's exactly what the far right is doing. That's exactly the approach reverses from the far right. So if we're saying everyone is a racist, yes, for us, for example, it's very easy to say because of the past. Mm. Very, very easy. Uh, I would disagree harshly mm. because if Austria was to be racist, okay, 29% is the Freedom Party. Have you seen, uh, when we look at the results of Vienna, that's the mm. capital, capi uh, that's still the socialist ruling. Mm. That's the capital. And you, you don't, and you see that they, are, they gained actually in the capital. So yeah. if all Austria is racist and it's 30%, then why the capital is not? Yeah, I completely agree. And, and it, it's time for the left to stop using this. It, it's a very, um, very intellectually lazy explanation that they use um, to, to absolve yourself of any, uh, any responsibility. Because if, if the world is racist, then there's nothing you can do. They've just got hatred in their hearts for immigrants. And that's it. Um, and it's, it's so easy and convenient. Also Also, when you look at the results of the Austrian elections, um, Vienna, the Social Democrats are number one, which as a city has the most migrant refugees whatsoever. It's where there are the least migrants and refugees where they voted for the far right. That's the interesting part. So you, you, you see this as a narrative. It doesn't have a standing because if you don't have, if you don't have migration, uh, in your region, if you don't ever have seen a, a refugee, if you have no idea what actually a refugee or a migrant is, because you are somewhere in the Austrian Alps, um, in a sea, in a ski resort, then why are you voting for the far right? You're actually not affected. Where you you see in many districts where they actually have a large percentage of foreigners, that there was the vote. The vote was not for the far right. Mm. Well, and that's, that, that's a very, very important part. There you go. Well, thank you very much, Kostadina, for this. And, and on that note, I think uh, we'll leave it. My pleasure. I just hope that the left uh, can learn from this result. I know that uh, DN25 will certainly be internalizing it and, and, and looking at it. And, and if you're a left party out there or if you're on the left, please look at this issue, look at this problem, <laughs> this win with curiosity. Um, and try to understand what's behind it so that we can mount a successful fight back because um, that's the only way forward. It's the only way, the only, the only possible reaction that I think we should be having to it. Ah, Kostadina, thank you again. Um, Kostadina is on Twitter at third eye three. Um, that's her Twitter handle. And thank you to you out there. If you've got thoughts or comments on this, please put them uh, in the comments below. I know this has been a bit of a, uh, maybe a controversial topic, um, but I'm, I'm very grateful that Cosentina, uh, you know, and I were able to kind of hash it out. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on what you think the left should do and what their reaction should be to this in terms of, in terms of learning and in terms of, uh, um, you know, how do we analyze it basically? Okay. Thank you very much. See you, uh, see you next time, everybody.